Hey, Tommy. I guess what I was able to do, one of the few journalists in North America to be able to do this. Uh, pay your bills. That's true. Yeah, I did pay <laughs> my bills. But uh, more importantly, I got to fly to Madrid okay. for one day, basically, and drive the new Nissan Aria. It's their new ground-up electric car. Very cool. And in this uh, episode, we're going to talk about everything that we've driven recently, talk about some cool stories and stuff that has happened around the office, because there's a lot of interesting vehicles kicking around, including the Mustang Mach-E GT, the Toyota RAV4 Prime, the new Hyundai Santa Cruz long-termer, and a bunch of other fun stuff. Yeah, so uh, Nissan did something interesting. Uh, they had uh, an international first drive of the Aria, uh, but because I guess in Spain you can't take a prototype car on the road, they did it on the track. And in order to kind of simulate uh, driving conditions on the track, they put cones out. So they had like a, a mountain course, a city course, uh, and then like an autobahn course. Uh, and you know what that managed to do? What did that do? Get almost every journalist sick <laughs> on the drive around the track. Because now, not only are we driving around a twisty track, but we're driving around a twisty track trying to navigate twisty cones, Tommy. So everybody got out of the car feeling pretty, pretty nauseous. So my question is, if you couldn't drive a prototype vehicle on the road in Spain, why have the event in Spain and not like Texas where you can drive anything on the road at any time? Well, because this was a world debut uh, or a world launch, and so they had media from around the world there. We were together with uh, the Germans who came up after us and the, I guess, the Norwegian countries. Uh, the Swedes and the Norwegians were there. But they got to drive other Nissans um, that we don't get as well. So they had other cars like the Nissan Micra, which we don't get, or the X-Trail, which I think is our Rogue, if I'm not mistaken, or the Qashqai, which is our Rogue Sport. Why couldn't you drive them? Because they were European spec cars, and their suspension is tuned differently. Their <laughs> engine choices are different, what? so they get a lot of like decent diesels that we don't get, right? Because Europeans love their diesels. So what, an American is not allowed to drive a European vehicle? Like, well, no, I mean, like our not, bottoms would collapse the suspension by just well, if they're not, so much as gracing the driver's seats. If they're not selling them here, they figured we, you know, we. It's uh, cool. I want to drive a. I want to drive I, a micro. Oh yeah, I would love to drive a micro. Uh, but you know the. Uh, uh, the American press team, uh, PR team from Nashville, didn't want to feel like, you know, all of a sudden there are going to be all these reviews that popped up around the world of the area. And, you know, since we're getting it this fall, right, uh, we have uh, we have none. And so they, they selected a very small group of journalists, and I was lucky enough, thank you, Nissan, to be one of them. They flew us uh, to Madrid basically for, like, you got there like on a Sunday, we drove on a Monday and flew home on a Tuesday. So that's a long way to go. Uh, and then, of course, it rained cats and dogs the whole time. So we were there uh, during basically a torrential downpour. So apparently it does rain in Spain on the plane. You know that song? Um, I do not. No? No? It rains in old? Spain? <laughs> uh. <laughs> like a 50s song? It's like a, I don't know, it's like a... Um, uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? No, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plane. I think that's like a, a song from Sound of Music. <laughs> uh, you never heard that? Uh, just generational? Let's see. Okay, I'm looking it up. I think it's called My Fair Lady. Yeah, it's from My Fair Lady. That's right. The Rain in Spain. 1956. Me. So you probably listened to it in college. Yes, that's right. I was, <laughs> I was 25 and 56 when I was listening to that song. <laughs> it's from My Fair Lady. But apparently it, it does rain there a lot. Uh, and so uh, it was pretty interesting. You know, I mean, uh, obviously Nissan was one of the first companies to go electric with the Leaf, right? Yep. And one could argue that, that, that they didn't exactly set the world on fire with the LEAF, and that's because they still have uh, tax credits, so they didn't actually burn through their tax credits with the LEAF, and the, that means that they haven't sold 250,000 of them, right? Well, I would argue that um, they probably did do a good thing by not setting the world on fire, unlike General Motors with their Bolt, but, okay. you know, All right. well, story oh, for another oh, day. Oh, gee, I'm sorry if you're listening <laughs> to this. That's Tommy, not me. Send all your correspondence. Well, I thought the, Le the Nissan LEAF was the best-selling EV globally in the Global entire world. Globally? Mm -hmm. until, until the Tesla 3 Model 3 surpassed it. But for a long time, it, it held that crown. But it didn't sell all that well here in America. However, they did point out in their media presentation that in the last month, LEAF sales are up like 300%. It well, makes sense. <laughs> I wonder why, huh? <laughs> yeah. They sold 577,000 LEAFs globally by February of 2022. That's a lot of leaves. Yeah, Nathan has one. Yeah? People yeah. like leaves, actually. Any, yeah. People I mean, that own them, they really like leaves. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we can go into the whole leaf story, but let's talk about the area, uh, which is, you know, their first after the leaf ground up electric car. Uh, so there's, some would say their second ground up electric car. Yes, after the leaf, yeah. Uh, and it's rolling on 20s, dude. I think it's got 20s. So why didn't they call it like the tree or the branch? I don't know. That's a good question, yeah. What, they, is, they, does, they, what they does ARIA mean? Is there like a meaning behind ARIA? Uh, you know, every time I see ARIA, I think of a hotel in Vegas. Uh, but now it's a car. Uh, and uh, what is unique about the area, well, it's hard because it's a mid-sized crossover. According to babynames.com, yeah. the name Aria is primarily a female name of American origin that means a ray of hope. There you go. It's a That's ray, pretty cool. It's a ray of hope. You, you, you know what? You're, you're big, you've been to Japan. You're a big fan of Jap Japan, Japanese uh, things, all things Japanese. Mm -hmm. You know what the inspiration for this car was? Can the Dustbuster. No, no, it wasn't. The dust <laughs> look at it. Can you guess what the inspiration? It kind of has that look to it. Something that is extremely fast, extremely quiet, and very somewhat luxurious. That is a form of public transportation in Japan. Uh, the bullet train. Exactly, you got it. So that that's what inspired the leaf. It was the bullet train. You can kind of see that. No. I do not see that <laughs> at all. Kind of, it does not look the like the bullet that. train has a big nose, right? And then well, the bullet train looks like a duck. And, th and this <laughs> <laughs> looks like a bullet train. <laughs> so the bullet train inspired him something very quick and very luxurious and at the same time uh, very serene, right? Because you're going like 300K on a bullet train and yet it's very serene. So that's what they were going for. Uh, and then they also used, and I can't pronounce it, so I'm not going to even try. They, they did not accomplish that, I'm sorry, they also with, the, with the design and this thing. They also used, there's this Japanese lantern that has this very intricate woodworking, mm -hmm. and so they used that design. You can kind of see it in the, in the grill, and when you get inside, everything has got this kind of hand, artisan, woodworking-like Japanese lantern design language. And the coolest thing in there, I think, is this little electronic glove box that, like, slides out with a push of a button. Yeah. Uh, and you could put your, you know your phone in there and hide it, or if you're in Texas, you can put your Bible and your gun in there. Well, I'm not sure Nissan wants to hear that. Um, as much as I don't like why, it. Why not? <laughs> it's Texas. First of all, you think they're going to be selling a lot of rose gold Arias in Texas? Uh, Truck country? America? Walmart? That's the big a good gold? question. That's a good question. They, they may or may not be. I don't but, know. There's uh, probably a lot of people in Austin who, who will be buying Arias. I, I think that the exterior in this is not a not a very attractive machine, but the inside is really cool. I love like like kind of the floating airy concept. I love the two-spoke steering wheel and the big screens and kind of the open poorness that they have. Yeah, the, the other thing they did was they took like, it looks like wood, and then they hit the... They put these haptic buttons behind the wood, and you can't see them until you turn yeah, the car on. Yeah, I don't like haptic buttons, but that's a cool way to do it. I think it's a really beautiful interior. I love the seats. Um, and did it drive nice? Well, I'll tell you that in a second. Look, look where the dry, look where the charging port is. What 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 is different from that from the Leaf? Uh, the Leaf has on the nose. Yeah, and they moved it. That was a very controversial uh, decision on the part of Nissan. They moved it away uh, from uh, the nose, and they also got rid of Chatamo. Yeah, uh, so, that was a big change for sure. So now it's C. CS mm -hmm. uh, in Europe, but still Chatamo in Japan, and of course CCS here in America. Yeah, that's they're really big in Chatamo in Japan. Yeah, so let's yeah. talk numbers. Uh, you've got two batteries uh, that are possible in the vehicle. Uh, usable 63 kilowatts. They didn't give us the entire number, but usable 63 or I think 87 kilowatt so hours. Got, kilowatt hours. Uh, kilowatt okay. hours. Yeah. yeah. So either 63 usable or 87 usable. Mm -hmm. uh, either front wheel drive or dual motor all wheel drive. Uh, depending on you know which one you choose, and they'll be available um, hopefully this fall. Uh, and 150 kilowatts of maximum charging. And the unique thing about this electric car, Tommy, for all you electric car fans out there, is that Nissan says it can sustain 130 kilowatts of charging uh, in, in its entire curve. Now, I, I think that number is very squishy because you know we've done a lot of electric car charging, <laughs> and, and we never able to maintain a high rate uh, at any you know public charging station. It always depends on like you know, where the moon is apparently, because there's so many factors that determine that. But Nissan says if in all, in under perfect conditions, or maybe not, you can get 130 kilowatts of power in there for a sustained amount of time. So very cool stuff too, 87 kilowatt hours usable with uh, liquid cooling, which is fantastic. Yes, the got rid of the air-cooled leaf batteries. That was the biggest issue with the leaf batteries, especially from like longevity problems, right, where you see the big degradation, it's because it was all air-cooled. Um, but this is now liquid-cooled, which is fantastic. I think the CCS is a great move here in the States, get away from Chatamo, which is finally starting to die out. And um, 
All right. And then they're saying that the 63 kilowatt hours is going to be available at a later date. Yep, and no frunk. No frunk, oh. No, no, they said they moved the HVAC into the front area of the car where normally the frunk would be, so you open up that <clears throat> the hood and all you see are like orange cables and uh, inverters and all kinds of electrical bits and pieces, but no frunk, unfortunately. But you do have, you know, a lot of room. It's one of those cars that's like, Nissan would say, and I, and I agree with it, it's a size of like a Rogue, but with the interior of a Murano. So it's it's kind of bigger on the inside than on the outside. Did they let you open up the front, or do you have to go to a dealer? I just pulled it. Like the Not like Mercedes, I just, okay. I just pulled a little latch and popped it open. I'm like, yep, a lot of scary orange cables. Don't want to touch those. I mean, I think that there's a little bit of NSX in the front end. And then that, that is... Uh, they said those headlights are, are the thinnest in the biz, 20 millimeters. That's how tall they are, like this big, like the size of a chiclet. Why can't we have a normal-looking electric car? You know? Uh, Just like a conventional... I think the Golf tried that. It didn't work, the e-Golf. But that was a compliance car. That was a gas car that <laughs> I you think they tried. It I would love to see like a fresh, normal electric car. Uh, like, it's kind of cool, that, that whole like LED in the front, that the one that... Looks like a boomerang, you know, the turn signal, and that all lights up. That's pretty cool. It just feels like a blob, the car, you uh, know? Yeah. I know I understand the aerodynamics are, are a big deal, but I just wish we'd have a normal, sporty-looking electric car. Anyway, if you guys want to see my first drive review, uh, we've got two. I, I put up just a one-take over a TFL car, uh, and uh, right now, by the time this airs, we'll probably have a much more in-depth uh, review uh, over at TFL EV or go to tfl-studios.com to see all of... Uh, our content in one place. And by the way, we're refurbishing TFL Dash Studios. We're making it much more uh, user friendly, Tommy. It looks, oh. like, it looks like something for kindergartners right now. Okay. Big blocks of pictures. And I'm tired of that, so I want to make it more, <laughs> more, more, more uh, newsy and less kitty. Uh, so, so yeah, and you can you can see how everybody got sick driving around uh, a cone course on a race course. Does it drive nice? It drives like an electric car. So it's probably pretty fast. It's uh, this one was a '63. Uh, this is a European one, and I'd say it was a zero to sixty time of maybe seven seconds. So I would say it was, it was leisurely for an electric car. Uh, Nissan saying that when you get to the uh, eighty-seven kilowatt hour usable battery, you're going to get about five seconds zero to sixty. They're all wheel drive, right? This was a front wheel drive. Uh, um, by the way, in case you're looking at buying one of these, uh, fifty to sixty k. Ish. Okay. Ish. I think it's going to be cool. I, I really, I, uh, I, I do think it's going to be a pretty, pretty nifty looking little EV. Yeah, and it was interesting, like I say, uh, to be in Madrid uh, and to uh, go and, uh, and drive an electric car in Madrid. I was really shocked by some of the coolest cars. I did a little bit of like uh, Madrid car spotting. So we were we, we got to go on a little tour of Madrid the day before we drove this. Uh, we want to know some of the cool cars I saw? Yeah. What did you see? We did. Uh, well, so I was with a bunch of. People who are like specialty, like Tom Malagny, you know him from uh, yeah, great Stata, guy. Stata Charge. Mm -hmm. You know, he is for electric, Alex. Yeah, yeah. He was there with his videographer. And then there were some like other, like, uh, uh, was it Jerry Riggs Everything? Yep. He was there. Uh, I'm just trying to think of like the electric car people that were there. So on, on our bus tour of Madrid, we decided to play a little bit of a game and see how many electric cars we could spot. So we did spot the usual stuff, like Model 3s were pretty much everywhere. Well, not, I shouldn't say everywhere. A fewer than you see here in Boulder, but they were pretty ubiquitous in terms of electric cars. Uh, but guess what I saw? What did you see? I saw a Honda E. Okay. That was pretty cool. And guess what else I saw? What else? An Emmy. Oh, nice. Parked you found an Emmy. Emmy. I parked on the street. That's that little funky. So that was pretty cool to see one like in the wild in Spain. Uh, and then, um, you know, the usual Leafs, the usual things that you, you would expect you would see. Uh, a lot of Hyundais, actually, as you can see in this picture that we're looking at, Hyundai N was all over, plastered all over the racetrack. I think it's a, um, uh, an interesting thing how Europe is so far ahead compared to the States on their electrification. I don't know if Spain is, dude. The one thing our tour guide said is that, you know, Spain has its indigenous car manufacturer called Seat or Seat. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she said that, you know, you think if you're in Spain, you'd see a lot of Seats, uh, but the Spanish buy everything. You know, they, they just buy whatever they like. So I saw a lot of Renaults and I saw a lot of Citroëns. I didn't. I was looking for a Twingo. That was the only one electric car that I didn't see. I was, the Twingo? Yeah. Is that still being made even? Um... I think the Twingo's a gas car, isn't it? What's the one that's the, electric? The Zoe. The Zoe. I was looking for a Zoe. Sorry. Not, I was looking for a Twingo, too, but I was looking for a Zoe. Mm -hmm. did, not, did not see any Zoes 
uh, driving about. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? All right, so um, like I said, go head on over to TFL EV or TFL Car if you want to get a first-hand experience if you're looking uh, at potentially buying one. I think, like you're right, the interior is much nicer uh, uh, than the exterior. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nissan has been uh, promising this car for a long time now, right? We've seen it at various auto shows. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of like, just bring it. At this point, we're beyond almost like waiting for it. Now it just has to hit the market. And with all the supply cha chain issues and all the uh, chip issues, I think Nissan is also struggling to get them out the door. Uh, but the sooner the better because, you know, we're seeing a lot of electric cars uh, hitting the market right now that, that um, are going to be early mover advantages that are going to start taking on the Tesla dominance in our country. So let's talk about another one of those, uh, and let's talk about the Ford Mach-E. We just had one at the office. Tell me about it, Tommy. Well, we had the Mustang Mach-E GT, so it was a fast one. Uh, yeah. We had it for a week, and it is the sporty version of the Ford's all-electric crossover. So it's like a $60,000 uh Mach E, right? Yeah. It's got the GT badge on the back. Uh, but it doesn't have this ours didn't have the performance suspension. No, so it wasn't the performance uh package, but it it was um the, the standard Mach E. So like the, the performance, you get the adaptive dampers, you get a little bit more oomph I think out of the front motor is what they do on the performance. Uh, different wheels. We had the um uh, the, the, my friend Sophie even calls them the flower wheels. Okay. Um and yeah, I don't know. I, I kinda liked it. I, I was sh I was shocked because me and Nathan got to sit behind the wheel and do a buddy review. I was shocked just how tight it is. Uh, you know, me and Nathan are big guys. We're big boys, as I'm sure you can tell. Uh, and we were almost uncomfortably close to each other in the front seat, and I got in the back, and my head barely fit, and I could certainly could not see out the back. So, a lot of good things about it, but as um, you know, a utilitarian crossover, uh, it's lacking in space. I would say. That would be my biggest like that would be my biggest ding against it. I'm not you know I think everything else the powertrain there's two problems I had with it. So the powertrain wonderful, uh, the infotainment is a little bit laggy. A lot of mirror a lot of menus you know within menus within menus, uh, and uh, the ride was pretty harsh. So that seems kind of a cold review of it. So let me give you the positive. The build quality seems really good. Uh, the acceleration is once again you know electric car mind-boggling mind dazzlingly quick uh the styling is actually interesting you know i think they did a really good job of styling it uh but the ride and the room were a little on the rough and on the tight side i thought that the build quality was excellent yeah. um i really did like that i think the use of the front trunk is awesome really good space yeah, in the front yeah. um i yeah, what's the eh? I, I didn't like I didn't like a lot of it actually. Okay. Yeah. Fair I enough. just the the thing about like a, you see Mustang, you see GT. Yeah. Right. And I just every time I'm in a in a GT Mustang, yep. be it like a new one, be it one from ten years ago, be it from 15, 20 years ago, like they always just make you so special. It's like such a sense of occasion. All right. Sitting down low and looking through those narrow windows and seeing that long hood in front of you. Let, let me ask you this question: um, You pull up uh, to a parking lot. And you've got a choice of two cars, a Mustang GT or a Mach-E GT. Which one do you take? And this is going to be uh, the car that you're going to own for the next year. Which of those two? Well, it depends. No, I'm not saying. You, you, right now. And, and <laughs> Price-wise, they're very different beasts, right? Because the, the traditional uh, Coyote-powered one is going to be a lot cheaper. But you, you, I'm just putting you in this scenario. You know, you've been kidnapped. And you're taken to the parking lot, this mysterious parking lot, and they hold a gun to your set and they say, you have to have one of these as your car for the next year. Which one do you take? Well, there's a lot of variables that go into it. Just pick one. No, I can't just pick one. I'll pick, I mean, am I, am I young and single? Right like now, tomorrow. I take tomorrow. You're, you, you are what you are. Oh, the, the Mach-E. Really? Well, because it's the middle of winter in Colorado. I can't drive a rear-wheel drive Mustang. I would take the Mustang GT all day long. Like, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even think. I wouldn't, it would be like that Mach-E wasn't even there. Yeah, but I, I would jump in that GT and I'd... And immediately huge, get stuck in the snow bank That's outside. fine. I would have so... <laughs> with a huge smile on my face, I would drive and leave that Mach-E in a cloud of com internal engine combustion uh, exhaust with a huge smile on my face. Well, I where I was going with this is it doesn't make you feel as special as a standard Mustang. But it is a much more usable car, right? It's got five seats. It's got ground clearance. It's got all-wheel drive. It's got um, a much, uh, you know, more usable trunk. It's got the frunk. Um, so it, it's, it kind of brings the Mustang GT-ness to the masses, which is a good thing. Now, I am a, a, like a young single guy who likes V8 sounds, right? So, like, I, 
I would love a, a V8 Mustang. But the Mach E GT makes a lot of sense for a lot of people. So you're saying you, you go utility over passion? Well, if it's my and only emotion. car. I wouldn't. I'd go for that Mustang all day Yeah, long. but then you'd be calling me for a ride because you couldn't get it no, out of our driveway in I March. I put no tires on it. Yeah. Look, the you got three inches of ground clearance. The difference in, the... in price is like 20K, maybe 25 No. Oh, yeah. Have you... you seen the price of a V8 Mustang now? No, Google it. Let's find out. Most of them on the lots are mm. going to be 50 plus grand. Okay, just Google it. Yeah, let me go to Auto Trader. Let me get some real world. All right, go for but then you got to get real world numbers on the Mach E. Too. I will, yeah. But I'm saying there's like a 20k difference between them. No, I think the V8 Mustang now starts at 45. Starts at 45. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and it's probably going to be a manual. Yeah. You're going to get a manual Mach E. But you're going to have a smaller screen and a plastic interior. I don't care interior. about the screen. God, get rid of the damn screen. As I'm far, as I'm, I'm as, as, far saying, as I'm concerned, take a big piece of duct tape and cover the screen. Um, I think what they did really well with the. Uh, GT Premium starting at forty. Um, so forty, and this one, this one we had in here was sixty k. So GT Fastback. Okay, so the cheapest one is thirty seven. Yeah, I know they're still they're affordable. But uh, but the we had that Mustang in, in Hawaii that we drove, and I'm that such was a V six. No, it was a four cylinder, and I I'm, four, yeah, I'm such a fan of Mustangs. Yeah, and I drove this thing around for a week. And I was so disappointed. But it's a four-cylinder. Not you, by course. the engine. The engine was fantastic. No, it wasn't. It, it sounded I love like a, the engine. It, it, it sounded like it was flatulent. The interior, the interior in the Mustang is looking so bad. It's so plasticky, and it just it feels it's, like it's I, retro cheap. I will, I will, I will easily and happily ignore all that with a massive V8 under the hood. Call me old school, and I know. And then call and, me a tow truck when you're in the ditch because it's and the middle I, of winter. Ironically, the the, the Mach E GT is going to be quicker in, in a drag race. Oh, it'll kill it. It'll kill it, but yeah. it still take the V8. Well, that that's, because that to me that to me that car has like, you know, that. Beautiful exterior where, like, you park it and you oh, look. You I love turn, it. You turn around when you walk away from it, and you're like, "Wow, that is, you know, that is a badass looking car." Gorgeous car, absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Beautiful, yeah, yeah but completely impractical for so, most people. Uh, you got four seats. <laughs> in a, in I a, could not ride in the back in, seat in a, of a Mustang. In a, in a pinch, you rode in the back seat. Well, I you're hated in every minute of it. It was oh, terrible in the back seat. Just, well, I'm just saying, like, you I just keep digging yourself into a deeper ditch. Well, well, you would literally be in the ditch in no, your I Mustang. I'd put snow tires on it. Yeah, and what happens if it snows four and a half inches? How are you getting to work? I'll still those exactly. snow tires are there you go. amazing. Yeah, amazing. do they do they give you up to six inches of ground clearance in the in the, in it the winter? It becomes a snowplow. It's V eight snowplow. I uh, love look, that too. I'd, I'd be, have a huge smile on my face. I was that not thing in the snow. I was not hugely enthralled with the Mustang because like there was not a lot of drama behind it. Right? There's not a huge amount of excitement right. and noise and drama. You're making my point. Everything you get in the, in the regular. Having movie. said that. Yeah. It that goes. long hood, dude. Oh, come on. Look at that. That hood goes on forever in a Mustang. Uh-huh. And those headlights, they look like they could burn holes in you. They're so mean. Does, yeah, but I if it's my only car, I can't drive it half the year. You I can can't carry my friends tires. in it. You can I can't, you I can't go. Seats. No, it's just impractical. And that's what it does. That is the cool thing about the Mach-E GT is it is very practical and it is stupid fast. Um, and it's much cheaper to run. You get the federal tax credit. There's a lot of benefits to the Mach E GT. You have to admit. Uh, and it's going to be worth nothing in five years because battery technology is going to move on. Uh, and the Mustang GT is going to be worth a lot because it's the last of the big old V8s. Yeah. It's so, going to be so, worth as much as the, the, the next high schooler that puts it into no, a ditch no, is going no, to no, be no. worth. It's going to be worth a lot Look, more. If you spend the money on a Mustang GT yeah. and get a nice one, yeah. like uh, with the, the performance package. How about a, and the, how about a bullet? Yeah, great. You can 50, get that. You can get that. Those 50, are 50, 55 yeah. grand for yeah. a bullet. Yeah, or or love it. Great. But once again, like if if I had two cars, yeah. I would get a V8 Mustang and a Snap. If this was my only car, the Mach E makes a lot right. of sense. All right, that's we're very different in that. Okay, makes a lot Fair of enough. sense. Fair enough. So let's let's go to the. Then one. we are not very different. You drive. You will refuse to drive a rear-wheel drive car in the winter. You have plenty of cars to drive in the winter that no, are front-wheel drive. Because I have a truck. But I'm saying if, if there if, you if, go. If, uh, but I, look, I, you, I, I'll put myself in that. I can only drive one car for for the rest of the year or one year and I choose between the two I would not even I wouldn't even see the Maki I would be like score I get a GT and I would be happy as a clown you wouldn't year. see the Maki because it'd be so far in front of you no, cause I'm accelerating so, away I wouldn't even like what is that it's some goofy looking you know and then it some, roasts some, your doors some, off some the... goofy looking you know car that tried to steal this thing's name that's what I would say to myself yeah I, I, it's a very look 
I'll put it this way. Have you been in the back seat of that Maki? It's, it's not good. A, it's, I mean, yeah, okay, the, 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 the GT is... It's good. Like, I was just back there. It's not good. It is good. It's, it's, it's got the scalloped roof. Yeah, yeah, and the scallop. Okay, if you're sitting in the scallop roof, you look over to your left. What do you see? For me, maybe my maybe my upper torso is taller. I have a weird torso. I'll give you that. I'm like a tall upper torso, short legs. I look over, and all I see is roof. If I want to see out the thing, I got to like hunch down and try to look out like the window like this and actually see out of it. If I'm sitting comfortably in the seat and I look over, all I see is roof. I would argue. Right? I, I don't even see the window. The Mach E GT. Eyes are that high. The Mach E GT yeah. is more of a muscle car than an actual Mustang. Because uh, if you look at what the original muscle car was, yeah. it was a family hauling vehicle. So it wasn't all wheel drive, I'll tell you that. It was a family hauling vehicle. You can't, even do, you can't even do a burnout. It was a family hauling vehicle that they shoved the most horsepower in as possible. What, what, what is the definition of a muscle car? A burnout. And you can't do a burnout it's in not, a GT. Not the definition <laughs> of a muscle car. Of course car. it is. It's V8 Roar, it's a V8, and it's a burnout. Those are the two it's definitions very, yeah, of a yeah. muscle car. In 1965, that's a great definition yes. of a muscle car. 2023. Yes. That was that kind of antiquated. You're over here. Oh well, a muscle car's got to have four not, panel fitment, and it's, it's got to. It's not antiquated. That's exactly what a tra- yeah. Challenger is. It's the same thing. Once a again, Hellcat, Challenger. I think V8, I think what burnout. we're seeing here is a little bit of a generational gap, because I think folks my age are really no, into no. the electric. Screamer that will blow the doors oh, off no, anything no, of our parents' playing, generation. Now you're the age card. Give it's me a break. true. There's, there's a lot of kids your age it's who, true. who would love a Lamborghini with a big old V10 in it. Yeah, just there's, as much. there's some of them, yeah. but yeah. all of my friends. And there's a lot of kids your age who would love like a BRZ, and there's a lot of kids your age who would love a true. WRX. True. So don't give me this like, oh, you're old and you're just like. First of all, I was never a muscle car guy. Right. Because so I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't even around as a car guy in the 60s. <laughs> right. I, was, I grew up in Europe, so in when, when the height of the muscle cars, I came to America just in time for the oil crunch, right? Right. And that was like Chevette's and Vegas. So so I wasn't even there for that. It's it's not even my generation. But you're trying to relive. No, no, I have it's no. It's like the last gasp no, of. No, no, no. We need no, a V8 in no. our car. So we bought a lot of old cars, right? Mm-hmm. Let's see, what have we bought? So let's let's talk about the cars that we own right now. Old cars, right? Mm-hmm. We own a, a Ducheveau. Mm-hmm. That's about as far from muscle car as you can get. Wait, well, so why are you so defending the V8? Because I love it. I think it's incredible. I it's, like it too, but times are... It's one are, of my favorite cars. Times are changing. Times are changing. Yeah, buy it now and, and hold on to it and make money on it. When, Look, it when, when people finally understand what they're missing out on versus... I mean, what was what, what is arguably the first muscle car? It's the GTO. GTO. And yeah. what was the GTO? The biggest engine that um, John Z. DeLorean yeah, could it, it shove was, into a Pontiac it, Tempest. It, it, so, the G, first of all, the GTO wasn't like a Studebaker that was renamed a Studebaker uh, GTO, right? That's, it was. That's, that's, that's another... It literally was. No, it, it was a Pontiac Tempest yeah. with a GTO performance package on top of it. Yeah. It was a box you ticked. It wasn't even in its own individual model yeah, efforts. They, 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 did, they didn't call it a Tempest... E, right? They, 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 they called it a Pontiac Tempest GTO. No, it became its own thing. Unlike, but unlike not Ford, which is, which is Ford's trying to kind of sponge off the name and of the brand of the Mustang by creating this goofy crossover. That's the other thing I hate. I, 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 you know, I don't want to do a rant, but I'm already really tired of, like, manufacturers taking what used to be classic car names and badging and trying to put them on things so that people buy them. And you know what I'm talking about, Blazer. Classic example of it, right? What Chevy should have done with the Blazer all day long is recreate what Ford did with the Bronco. Instead, they put it onto. Yeah, you know, that was a bad move. That, that was, was a, a bad misstep. move. Porsche Taycan Turbo. No, 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 no. You know, call it anything else. <laughs> Don't call it. There's no turbo in the car. For the longest time, Porsche was so very German and so very strict about their naming that, that you know, you got exactly what the car said you got. And now all of a sudden they decided, you know what, Hans, let's take this electric car and let's call it a turbo. Why? I don't know. But it, it devalues that history, that brand equity, that provenance of all those turbos, turbos that came before them, that every single one of those had a turbo in it. Now, what turbo is in the thing? It's a bunch of software that says basically use more of the battery pack when you're accelerating versus the, the 4S or, you know, the, the regular Taycan. It's just it's becoming like a branding exercise versus, as a car guy, you know, a real mechanical differentiator. All right, I'm going to give you... That's my rant. Here's what this sounds like. Ready? Right. It's a branding exercise as to why you can't use the name in it. You know what? 
You know what that sound was? What? What? That was the sound of your electric getting quieter and quieter as these electric cars go zooming off into the future, leaving gasoline well in its dust. Yeah, I'm not there arguing that. I think electric cars are They're the faster. Um, they're, they're cheaper to run. Uh, they're better for the environment so, in the long term. So you, you know what Nissan did? And I, I didn't do a video on it because it was raining outside very hard. They had, interestingly, a Leaf uh, with their new E-Force uh, all-wheel drive system. So yeah, they, you should have driven that thing. Apparently, it's crazy. I did. I drove it. I, I did. did I you? Drove, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I got a TikTok. I haven't published on it yet. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it does 0 to 60 in like, I don't know, four seconds or something. Uh, and, but interestingly, and, and I, I kind of actually agree with them, so what they did was they used it as a test mule to create an all-wheel drive car, and then they came up with this idea that all-wheel drive cars, because of the instant torque, you know, are, are sickness-inducing, right? They make people, uh, and, and I know as a car guy that it seems wrong to be arguing against right. quicker 0 to 60 times, but what... Uh, an ICE car will do is it'll have kind of a gradual, even if it's a, like a McLaren, it'll do 0 to 60 in 6 seconds, it's still kind of a gradual acceleration. There's a little bit of a build into it. With an electric car, you get instant torque, and it just slams you back into the seat, right? And the blood goes rushing out of your eyes. And the first time you do it, you get this huge, goofy smile on your face, and you're like, this is a lot of fun. But by the 10th time you do it, you're like, I think it's making me sick. Uh, and if you do it with, like, your mom in the car, she will, like, uh, you know, walk out. She'll she'll leave the car and walk out because she will not find that amusing. A lot of people won't find that amusing. So what Nissan did was they tried to take that instant torque in this Leaf with all-wheel drive. I called it the world's fastest Leaf because I think it is, or at least world's quickest Leaf. And they tried to make it so that it kind of uh, takes the edge, takes the performance envelope and smooths it out a little bit so it's not so abrupt, so it's not so crazy, not just in a straight line, but also going around a turn, right? So you're not like slamming down all this torque and all this power at the same time while you're going around a corner when you're trying to accelerate. And it works. It's actually pretty interesting. It's an interesting exercise. And I think for a lot of people, uh, it's going to be something that they'll really appreciate. That's exactly what Mazda said. For what? They're like, you know what? We want slower cars. These cars are too fast. Yeah, that's, let's make them slower. That's the headline. But but if you if you dive deeper into it, and you actually <laughs> think about what if you if you, no, it's just marketing. If you listen to what Nissan's saying, because the issue with that argument, Dad, is it's not an on and off switch. It has an accelerator. You know, push on it less than full. Uh, well, that doesn't help you go around a turn, though, right? It's I not, I, that, I, I understand I mean, not, the not, logic. Not, not, not everybody's Paul, a race car driver, right? Most people aren't that subtle in their driving. I always hate when a computer decides how I need to drive. I want to have full control over that vehicle's well, acceleration. You shouldn't drive any modern cars because your well, know, yeah, stability control that's true. is all I mean, so the thing we should explain is every electric car does this. Yes. Every single one has a torque curve ramp up. Um, this is not like a Nissan invention. It's just a matter of how quickly they allow you to access all the Well, they torque. also, with this with this Leaf, they also use like torque vectoring, right? Right, yeah, yeah, which is cool. So there was more to it than but, just, like, just like cutting the, changing the torque curve of the power delivery. But, um, I mean, every EV has a torque curve because you just roast tires and CV axles if you gave 100% of the torque from zero. I'm just saying it, it is, you know, when we had the Model Y performance, I did that acceleration run about 10 times, and it was fun to like put... WRXs, Hellcats in their place with a Model Y performance, because you will do that, right? right? Uh, but I do see the other side of that coin and that it can be like, you know, dangerous, right? We did a story a couple months ago where somebody took a model as plaid and basically plowed into a house because they lost control of it. You get a lot of weight moving very quickly uh, and you've got, you know, the potential for a lot of damage. There was just a story this weekend. Did you see that guy who who jumped the the Model S? Right. Did I know. You see that that was yeah. A, yeah then that ran was away. some kind of stunt though. Um, but the, it was apparently it was apparently a rented Model S. Oh really? Yeah. And then the kid ran away. Very interesting. Yeah. So I'm just saying I'm saying you're putting basically I've got a great solution. a machine gun in the hands of a lot of people who probably shouldn't should or don't have the responsibility to to own a machine gun. You know, that's what people said in the 1960s during your muscle car era. Yeah, they said these people, cars are too powerful and, and they're too of, unsafe. And, and, it, and it's true. A lot of people either got very hurt or died. But I think the solution to that is just give it a chill mode like Tesla does. So you've got like in yeah, a Model Y, we had a normal mode, then you click on yeah, chill and idea. it tames it down. So I think there, there, is, there is a place for the research. Yeah, to do. yeah we're, we're pointing at the Aria. Don't worry. It does not have that problem. But the, <laughs> the, the dangerous precedent you're setting there is, oh, these cars are too fast. Let's just lock them and chill forever. You yeah, know? And, and, and there will be... Probably governments that'll do that. 
uh, if, you know, maybe not ours, but there certainly might be. I can see governments doing that, or there will be ways that advocates for safety will want that to happen. I agree. Right. And, and then there'll and be it, hackers that'll undo it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just going to be something, and then there'll be people, you know, who will get sued. You know, it's just going to be a... It's going to be a wild west for a while. But you really don't understand the Mustang Mach-E appeal? No. Of the pure silent muscle car? No. I think it's pretty cool. I'm, now, I'm just, I'm just like... I do agree with you. I'm it's, just like, if you're going to make an electric Mustang, make an electric Mustang. Well, that'd I would be love really that. cool. Yeah, I'd love that and too. And then call this the Galaxy. Get yeah. a Galaxy. I, I do think that probably the Mustang name... I mean, they should have just called it the Mach-E, and then we wouldn't be having this argument at all. Yeah, I, Get rid I, of Mustang. Not even Mach-E. That's also a classic Mustang well, Mach, That would be Mach-1. Yeah. You know, yeah, Mach is already in a Mustang. I'm uh, just saying, I'm just saying. You know, maybe I'm this this one this time. I'll take that. You can you can swipe. Maybe I'm old and curmudgeon. But, but I, I, I mean, think a Mustang should be a Mustang. You're saying a lot of things which I agree with. I think that the the actual Mustang is a lot more soulful. It, like I started saying at the beginning before we hit this rant, like I miss that long hood and the low swept roof line, um, and and that's where I don't think I, I was a little disappointed by the Mach E GT. That just the, the, the drama of a traditional Mustang. But at the same time, zero to sixty and three point well, eight is pretty pretty impressive. It's like the, the the problem I have with it, Tommy, is like you're trying to put a round peg in a square hole. So to me, the Mustang is all about emotion, right? It's all about passion. It's like it's like it speaks to your heart, and the Mach E speaks to your head and you were having that conversation you were saying i like the utility i like the fact that it's all-wheel drive I like the fact that i put my friends in it right and, and so it's like it's like two brands that don't two things that don't fit into one brand i get it from a marketing point of view you want to create something that's like approachable and understandable uh, but the two don't belong together you know one is sporty and passionate and fun the other is utilitarian uh, fuel efficient and um, quick but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean fun. Anyway, let's move on to the car that d did get everything right uh, that we've been driving. Uh, and that is, I think, probably the best Toyota out there right now that you can buy, which is the RAV, RAV uh, Prime, RAV4 Prime. Uh, and the reason I love the RAV4 Prime is simple. Uh, it's because it's a car that I think is the second quickest Toyota that you could purchase right now. Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about it. It's a midsize crossover. Uh, that, that combines the best of everything. It's got an internal combustion engine, so you can drive it like, like an engine, but it also has a big enough battery pack where you can get, I think, what, 40 miles of range out of it. And then that battery pack is not only used to be able to go all electric for 40 miles, which, let's face it, is enough to go to work and back for a lot of people, right? Uh, but you can also use it to blow the doors off many other cars because all that battery power is then used to make the quickest RAV4 out there. And it's completely ruined by one thing. What? The that? fact you can't buy it. Uh, I know it's I know. I was just talking to someone yesterday it's who like wanted the, like it's too good. Wanted my opinion on it. Well, it's the, it's it's the dealer network which is the problem. I was talking to him. He's like, I went over to Boulder Toyota. Yeah. They had one on the lot. I was about to buy it, and then they slapped ten thousand dollar dealer markup on it, and I walked right on out. And that's the issue with the Rav4 Primes is that everyone you see is going to have five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollar markups on them. Um, Dealer shenanigans. Huh? Yep, and it's a fantastic car. I right. love it. It's also, I mean, the other so, conversation so, you can have was, would you pay fifty thousand for a uh, Rav Four Prime at MSRP, let alone sixty thousand with the markup? So what you're saying, Tommy, and we should have that discussion. Is I mean, this is easy to stop, right? He didn't buy it, and the next person, but at some point, somebody is going to buy it. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. So if we didn't have that person who was going to pay ten thousand dollars, so if we all got together here, all of us listening to this, and all of us who you know want this to end the the easiest way to do it would be just we will not pay nobody will pay uh over sticker based on some you know bs uh verbiage on the little label that says uh market adjustment right which mm -hmm. is complete bs it's just greed let's just why don't they just put the, let's just call it greed just call it dealer greed right i want to i want a house payment for my new boat you know i want a bigger house i want to send my kids to a better school i mean that's what it really is right, right. that's but, what we're really talking about because that money i don't think that money is like you think the salesman then gets a portion of that well, are they incentivized to, to try to actually i mean what the dealers will tell you is that they have such low inventory right now and they have such a difficult time getting vehicles that that isn't that isn't boat money. That is pay my rent money because that's the only way we're going to keep these employees employed. Didn't we just do a payroll protection program? I, I don't want to get into the politics weren't, weren't, of it. I don't understand. I don't weren't understand. Weren't there dealers that. That, that got payroll protection money just for that reason, Tommy? Well, my did, point, I mean, did they get payroll? Did we as taxpayers fund dealers so that they could mark up their vehicles by ten thousand dollars? 
you know, and then, then, then throw that back in our faces and say, oh, the economy's bad, supply chain issues, we're lucky to be able to stay in business. Didn't we just give them money for that? I, I don't understand the politics of it. That I don't. Well, I'm just like, the politics are straightforward. We I just, haven't looked into it, I should as, say. As, as, as taxpayers, we just paid businesses to stay in business because of the pandemic. So the way that they rewarded us for that, if you're a dealership, is not by staying in business, but by overcharging uh, for you know the cars that they're selling now, and then calling foul on the fact that they can't get inventory. I, I don't buy that argument, as obviously you can tell. Okay. You don't want to go down that road. No, I don't want to go down that road because the comments are just it's it's just there's, a very toxic road to go down. No, I think there's going to be a comment that says you know you go dealers. You guys should be charging 20k over sticker. I think after talking to some dealers, there are probably some dealers that do feel that they they are unable to to pay their bills. And then the whole question is should the dealer model exist? I, I just don't want to. Okay, well, let's, let's it gets talk very about, political let's very talk quickly. About, you know, we, we do don't car, do politics. We do cars yeah. and trucks, not politics. So let's let's go and talk about the car. Let's say that you are looking for one and you do find a dealership that is actually selling them a sticker. What makes the car so good? Well, I mean, the, amaz- good? the amazing part about it is the 42 miles of all-electric range and then the 550 miles of gasoline range on top of that. So you got 600 miles of range, in theory, based on gasoline and electric. You can charge it up at home and basically run it for pennies on the dollar compared to gasoline if you're only running on electric for your commute. That's great. The 302 horsepower is amazing. 0 to 16, like five and a half seconds is what they claim. Um, quicker than a four-cylinder Supra, so it, it really is an amazing performer. Uh, the not so good. Uh-huh. It's a freaking expensive Toyota. How about off-road? How you just took it off-road? How is it off-road? Uh, it is a Rav Four, and there's an adventure model. <laughs> I take it. Yeah. Not good. No, it's an, got an amazing all-wheel drive system. Okay. It's got huge amounts of torque. It's um, it's really is a, a very well calibrated drivetrain. But it doesn't have enough ground clearance, and it's got 19-inch wheels and Yokohama all-season tires. Um, the biggest problem with the RAV4 Prime, which people keep pointing out in the comments on the videos we've done, it's a lot of money even before markups. So the one we're testing is $50,000 for a RAV4. You know, I want to say the, the average price of a car now in America is in, well into the 40s. It's like 45-ish, if I remember reading correctly. You can probably Google it. So you're not that far off from the average price of a new car in America, Tommy. So, uh, so that argument to me seems like... Uh, maybe maybe true that like two years ago, but with inflation I know. Run, running well, rampant and running crazy. This current driver article says a be- new price in the U.S. in December rose to forty-seven thousand. So you're you're three k off from the average price. Um, but I just I, I know I know with inflation, I'm, I'm with but I, it's a lot of money I'm, to spend my, on my, a Rav Four. Look, my brain is still like twenty twenty, right? In terms of what new car prices should be, uh, but we're no longer there. You know when when you can't really find cars in the thirty thousand dollar range anymore, let alone the twenty thousand dollar range. We are we are well into the looking glass and through it at this well, point. Well, so the other thing which I don't like about the Rav4 Prime is you really want to get the the faster charger. So there's two different chargers. There's a three point three kilowatt and a six point six. Mm-hmm. And the six point six makes it a lot more usable if you want to plug it in at work in the day and drive home on all or, electricity. Or like, do, can you do can you do level three? No, no. So it no. doesn't matter. So at least you get you get either slow or quick level two charging. Right, but the problem is the the 6.6 is not available on the base one, which starts at like 40. So um, you have to pay more for the 6.6. And I you really- just, I wish they had just put the yeah, 3.3 they just, is, is just, pretty useless. Yeah. They should have just put the 6.6 in all of them. Yeah. But um, I will say it is a fantastic thing to drive. And it's one of the few plug-in hybrids that you can drive on uh, electricity and um, feel like you've got plenty of power, plenty of torque, it's not slow, right, the gas I, engine isn't trying to kick on. I have, a qu- I have a suspicion and I have a question for all you guys out there who know about supply and how much things cost, right? So my suspicion is that there is no difference in actual cost to Toyota between a 3.3 and a, what is the other one, 6.6? Sure. So I don't think it costs them any more in terms of like actual componentry to, to do one or the other. And what they're doing is they're actually like downgrading the 6.6 to get you to upsell to the, to the I mean, to the, they're downgrading the 3.3 to get you to upsell to the right. 6.6. Right, which could be. Which I always hate when manufacturers do that. You know who does that a lot? That's another one that I, I don't like, the Ford with the uh, Maverick, right? If you get the $19,000 Maverick, which, once again, on Obtanium, uh, but if you want cruise control, which is just software right. Right, and a button, so 10 cents in software, you have to... A go to the next level. You can't get the base model. You got to go to the is it the XL I think, and that's a three thousand dollar up ticket. XLT so, probably is the yeah, next one. Yeah, so you got to pay three thousand to get like traditional cruise control. I'm not talking about lane 
holding or, you know, adaptive. I'm talking about just regular old cruise control, $3,000. I mean, but you, that's every brand. Every brand has examples of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, and I hate it. I mean, for example, um, uh, I've, I've read that on a Jeep Wrangler, right, the base models like mine don't have um, – uh, power windows. Yes. They've got crank windows. Yeah. The crank windows are actually a bit heavier than the power windows. Yeah. And I would wonder if they're actually more expensive than power windows too, because they build so many more with power windows that it that economy be, yeah. of scale comes in. Um, but uh, the, the funniest one I just learned um, from watching a thing on TikTok, some of the older Volvos, yeah. you, you, if you didn't buy heated seats, you got a little blank panel. Um, but you could pop off the blank panel, yeah. and underneath were two little buttons, and, those were, and those were heated seats. It was all wired up, ready to go. So it was cheaper well, for them to put the heated seats in and then cover it up with a blank. So button. what about like what Toyota is doing on like the Tundra, where they're going to make you pay down the line for remote start? Yeah, that's going to be an ugly situation. Yeah, that's going to be a bad situation. Uh, uh, you know, I, I guess the question, and I, I don't know, you know, those guys know their pricing models better than we know them. But my question would would it, it would be like, at what point is that going to become so onerous that people are like, I'm just going to go buy an F-150? Well, yeah, but then what, what if Ford starts doing it? What if they start following Toyota's model? You know, it's and at some point slow. you might end up with a class action lawsuit. Yeah, right? or 1985 or some, F-150. <laughs> some, yeah, or some attorneys will be like, hey, this is uh, anti-competitive. You know, let's let's let the DOJ, uh, take a look at it. Anyway, uh, let's talk about the other cars uh, that we've had. So I was just at, at Volvo on uh, in Palm Springs. Yeah. I drove two cars, the new XC60 Recharge, yes. which is their new plug-in hybrid Volvo, uh -huh. and the C40 Recharge, which is a new all-electric Volvo. And what a lovely little thing that is, by the way. That yeah. is a fantastic is a, little is car. Is that a hidden gem? Hidden gem, yeah. Which one of the two? Um, the both are good. Yeah. The plug-in hybrid's expensive, but it goes like stink. 455 horsepower mm -hmm. in a little Volvo crossover, which is crazy. And then the C40 recharge is uh, full electric. It's a little expensive, $59,000. The range is not very good, 225. But it's a beautiful thing on the inside. It's fast as heck. Um, really nice to drive. Just a lovely car to be around. If you can live with so, a smaller range, it's great. So I'm going to say thank you, Volvo, um, for lending us for taking Tommy out and flying him out to Palm Springs. Yep, videos in, on in TFL the middle of winter, EV. which is yeah. nice. <clears throat> and I have him drive that car. But I would also ask you, if you're feeling so magnanimous, send us one of the recharges. We've never had one in the fleet. Well, would you believe there's one coming next week? Get out. <laughs> or that's two a, weeks. That's great. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I've been dying to put, you know, get behind the wheel of one yeah, of those. XE40 recharge is coming um, uh, to us very shortly. And, and then, you know, kind of adjacent to it, we'd love to get our hands on a Polestar, too, at some point. Yeah, different team, though. I know. I know. I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> hey, if, if you're listening to this and you're a big fan of the show, send us a recharge and send us a Polestar. Uh, we'd love to actually test them. We, we're doing, uh, you know, gangbusters over at TFL uh, EV. And speaking of gangbusters, Tommy, did you know that uh, TFL Truck just hit a million subscribers? Woo! Can you believe that? Great news. Thank you for watching, everybody. A million subscribers, Tommy. You know how hard the team worked to get to that number? How many videos we've produced? How many tests we've done? How hard... Everybody's worked, um, and how lucky we are to have viewers that, that you know love that channel. So if you guys are fans of TFL Truck, uh, we're going to do a very special uh, thank you uh, million subscriber video coming soon. If you're listening to this, probably already up over at TFL Truck. So okay, super okay. cool. Uh, let's uh, yeah. You want to talk about one other vehicle, or you want to? Yeah, yeah. What do you want to talk about? Uh, I think, and this is kind of speaking of truck. It's a good segue. And this would normally be on truck, but it's kind of a car let truck let. Uh, speaking of great manufacturers, Hyundai just lent us for a year, Tommy, uh, a new Santa Cruz, and we've been driving the beans, beans. off of it. I yeah. was looking for a PG-13 word that I could say. Uh, started with B. Yeah, lovely. It's a fantastic vehicle, by the way. Um, I, I love it. I'm, I'm in love. It's I great. Am, I am smitten. I it's love really it. We've got this, like, sand color. People, I, people are, you know... People on the street are a little hit and miss on it, though. Some people I've talked to are like, wow, that's such a cool thing. Other people are like, Hyundai did a truck? Is it a real truck? I mean, but uh, what I look at it as is a much more practical, usable, and durable Tucson, right? I love I mid-size perfect. crossovers that's a perfect or compact crossovers. Great things, but you can't just throw stuff in the back. You have to worry about, um, you know, like I was carrying around big tires this week and some wood, and you got to worry about protecting the interior. The Santa, Santa Cruz... Plop whatever you want in the back and just go with it, and there, I love there, it. There is something about having like a bed that is much more utilitarian than just having a, uh, uh, you know, a crossover. Like, right, basically, it's like an outback with a bed, 
which is Baja, but you know, right. <laughs> right, but, but this is like Baja is long gone, but it, it is. Uh, and uh, you know, we've been getting ready for our new series, Go Big. And so we've been fairing around massive tires for the excursion and for the Suburban. And you just throw them in the back. It's all, the, 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 the back is completely lined, so you're not worried about like scratching it, breaking it right. Uh, and then you figured out how to lock that 10 out cover, so now you can uh, actually lock it so people can't get into it. It's, it's actually super utilitarian. Uh, and then you've got all like the lovely utility. Now, uh, the original plan for this, Tommy, was uh, we were gonna go turn it into like an overlander. Okay. But then what happened? Well, we realized that we just have too many trucks and off-roaders. No, that's not what happened. Well, we, I mean, that kind no. of is what happened. No, 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 that's, not, that's exactly not what happened. <laughs> what happened was uh, because of the supply chain issues and shortages, we wanted the base engine. We wanted the eight-speed automatic. Instead, we got the big turbo. I say big, it's not big, but, you know, it's still a four-cylinder turbo. And we got the dual clutch, which isn't grand off-road. I mean, it works, but it's not like, it's like you wouldn't, like... Uh, even even if we had the torque converter automatic, it you just yeah, buy a vehicle with a low range if you want to go deep no, into but the wilderness. So, and we wanted to like put bigger off-road tires on it, put a rooftop tent on it. But now, you know, with this one that is more uh, on-road than off-road based, right? Are you tired? You seem really tired. Yeah, I'm tired today. Yeah, you, you're like about to fall asleep. Here. I'm not falling asleep. Here's some caffeine. I'm just struggling. I'm struggling to see what you saw in the Santa Cruz is like a rock crawler. You know, because I think I mean, it's... I didn't a, say rock crawler, I said overlander. But let's be honest, right? I see this a lot online. People are like, ooh, I bought my Subaru and I spent $6,000 lifting it and putting big tires that's, on it. Yeah, that's why you want to do it with the, with the Santa Cruz. Just buy a Ranger or a Gladiator, you know? I hate to say it. The Santa Cruz, what makes the Santa Cruz so good is the beautiful ride quality of the independent suspension and the fuel economy and the ease of parking, you know, and the, 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 the size and the nimbleness. The second you start going into that world, you're, you're lifting it, you're putting bigger tires on it, you're going to ruin the ride, you're going to ruin the fuel economy, um, and you're not going to get all that much more capability out of it because it doesn't have a low range. So you can, you can spend a huge amount of money to make your vehicle look cooler and perform slightly better off-road, or if you're going to do that, I argue just by the vehicle with the low range that was intended to do that. Yeah, so because, because of that and because you know it wasn't quite the spec we were hoping for, what we are going to do is we're just going to throw some... Um, WeatherTech mats in there, which we just got from WeatherTech. Thank you. We got the back. We got to go pick up the fronts. And by the way, I do love those WeatherTech. It came with the uh, the furry carpeted ones, and we took it to the ranch, and immediately they just got <laughs> toasted, man. <laughs> oh, my God. They got so muddy because the ranch seems to have this um, – unique combination of clay and mud uh, that, that sticks to everything um, and makes just for a god-awful mess. Uh, and so furry carpets are not good. Uh, so I'm, I'm super psyched that we got our friends at Weather Tech to give us, you know, the plastic mats that are fit to the vehicle. The back ones fit like a dream. We just got to go pick up the front ones. Uh, and uh, we're just going to keep it for a year, and we're going to do a long-term review, drive the beans off of it and see how it holds up and, you know, see if it works. And actually the fuel economy of the thing has been really good, right? I think EPA is like 23, yep. which is, you know, not grand. We've been getting about 25, but I do love it a lot. I think it's fantastic in the city, which is where uh, a lot, let's be honest, even a lot of full-size trucks spend a lot of their time. It's got just enough space in the bed to hold a lot of stuff that you can put plywood in the bed if you need it. Um, it's great. They, they really did a great job with it. And it's more comfortable than Maverick. The interior is better than the Maverick. It's a better daily driver as a Maverick. Um, I like the all-wheel drive system more than the Maverick in some ways. So even though it's more expensive than the Ford, it does offer, I think, a lot of improvements and 5,000 pounds of towing, which is more than the than the Ford. That's another well. thing we don't have. We need to put a hitch well, we on it. we got to put a hitch on it. And, oh, we'll get that. And the other thing we did was we took weather. I feel like weather tech commercial, but this has just saved my life. So we have put the weather tech doggy uh, seat cover on it. Mm -hmm. And so Blaze now, I took him for a run and he got so freaking muddy and I put him in the back and just that seat cover just covered up the seats wonderfully and all the mud got on the seat cover and then I just vacuumed it out. It was such a joy. You know, you have a brand new car with 260 miles and to throw a muddy dog in the back seats is for me personally, it's just like, like, like nails on chalk you know it, it's very painful but overall can't wait to see what else we can do and we will take it off road and we will get it nice and dirty and I'm, look i'm not sure it's uh better than the maverick it's different it's better it is but i mean it, it's, it's not i don't think it's better it's just different it, the I maverick's know, a truck the this, maverick, is, this is a lifestyle vehicle people love the maverick and i'm going to yes. get a lot of hate for this and i understand why they love the maverick yeah. but i do have some problem with the maverick 
because I love the Maverick because of the affordability of the Maverick, right? And then Ford sneakily raised the price on the Maverick and then made it unavailable for folks to order, right? Well, they, they, they sold out of it. Right. That's a but I, I, have, I do have some problems with that. Yeah. And, I, and, and I feel like, you know, um, that maybe they should have predicted the demand better if they wanted to do that properly, right? M maybe they should have um, come up with a way to keep order books open and reduce production on another vehicle. But um, like the escape. <laughs> well, yeah, I just feel like Which it's based the on? price is amazing and it's such a good deal at the low twenty thousand dollar range. Yeah. And then if I wanted to go buy that truck, I just couldn't, you know. So you you feel kind of bait and switch. And then when I get the expensive Mavericks, I just I, I've driven them. I don't like them very much. I don't so the, like so, the, so the so turbo for. So in the last like three minutes that we have left, right? Right. That we're almost out of time. So let's talk about the differences. All right. Uh, so um, the the Santa Cruz. It's not inexpensive. It's like 35-ish. Ours is expensive. Yeah, that is the big drawback. And, and then the Ford, the expensive one, right, has some issues. It, first of all, the expensive one is four-wheel drive, which is grand. but All-wheel so, all drive. All-wheel drive. So is the Santa Cruz. But you can't get it with the, with the hybrid. So you lose fuel economy, right? right? Only the front-wheel drive is available in the hybrid. And to me, a truck without four-wheel drive is silly. But you can also keep in mind you can get the Santa Cruz in front-wheel drive, too. Right. I'm just saying. So I'm it's not saying, unique to the Ford. No, no, no. But I'm saying, to, to me, a f truck without four-wheel drive is silly. So the one I want in the Maverick is the hybrid, which gets incredible, like, 40s fuel economy. But I don't live in Florida. I need all-wheel drive in Colorado. So it's, like, off the menu right away. So why? So, so the fuel economy is irrelevant because I wouldn't buy it. Unless apparently you're buying a V8 Mustang and then rear-wheel drive is fine. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yes, it is fine because it was a comparison between gotcha two cars. Got you stuck there. No, Got gotcha you no, stuck. No, no, it was a comparison between two cars. All right, all right, all right, let's finish this off. All right. What's wrong Some, with that? Somebody takes you to a lot and there's a Maverick and there's a Santa Cruz, puts a gun to your head, you can only have one for the next year. Which one do you take? It depends on how I'm using it. No, you, you doesn't. <laughs> Tomorrow, somebody takes you to a lot and says, says, I don't like the gun to your head analogy. Hey, Tommy, you've won, you know, the sweepstakes. You can have one of these, but the deal is you got to drive it for the next year. That's the only way we're going to give it to you for free. Which of the two do you take? Well, it depends. No, it doesn't depend. It you, does depend. You have to pick one. Uh, well, we need, we need to finish your explanation right. because the Maverick is more trucky. You're right. Like, the bed is more usable in the Maverick. The, the, the slanty rear end on the Santa Cruz makes it not, not as usable. Um, I like the how it's perfectly square right. in the back of the Maverick. Um, the price on the Maverick is better. It just is better, right? Yes, yes. What I don't like about the Maverick is it feels like it's really built to a price point, which it is. There's just no way. And around. the ride is harsh. And the all the two wheel drive ride I thought was great. Yeah, the hybrid ride was really good. The all wheel drive ride I thought was very poor. The turbo ride was really not very good um, in the truck we had. So. Um, I would personally, because I don't need that little bit of extra space that the Maverick has, I would get the Santa Cruz. I like the look of it more. I like the interior a lot more. I think the fit and finish is better, and I like the towing capacity with the turbo. Okay. That being yeah. said, if um, if the hybrid was available in all-wheel drive, like you said, I'd get the hybrid all day long. That is a magnificent little powertrain, um, and it's, it really is a cool thing. What I don't get about the hybrid is they should just do what uh, Toyota does where they put a second electric motor on the rear axle and then do a, a, yeah. a system maybe, like that. Maybe Toyota's got that patented. No, there's other cars that do that. Um, I'm sure there's another way. There are that. other vehicles that, that do that. that. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and, and, and um, I wish I could, if I could go out and buy a $20,000 Maverick right now, I would, right? It's great for 20 grand or 19 whatever it launched at. Fantastic. But they need to get their production really cranked out on those things. Yeah, I mean, we're you know, the longer this supply chain chip issue goes on, the longer of a bigger and deeper of a hole we're digging, right? Because what's happening is that uh, there's much more uh, demand for new cars, and there's just not enough supply, and it's going to take them a lot longer to kind of have those two equate to each other once again, yep. equalize. Uh, so the last thing, because we're out of time, Tommy, uh, is I've got some good news. Um, we haven't shared this with anybody on the podcast yet, but let's bring it back to electric. Uh, Andre told me last night that we've got a VIN for our new Lightning. Oh, sweet! Yeah, there's a VIN. That feels real. We, you know, when 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 the, when the truck is assigned a VIN. Do we have a production date? Yes, we have a production date. Oh, yeah. Do you know when it is? April 18th. That soon? Yeah. Are you sure? Yes. I it seems April, too early. Or maybe it's May. Maybe it's the beginning of May. Uh, anyway, it's it's the next month or two, and we have a VIN. And when you have a VIN, that means that you're you're well on your way. To actually, like all your Rivian uh, holders out there, if you don't have a VIN, you're 
that's just all <laughs> that's all in the air, right? When when it gets serious is when they start assigning VINs because VINs then there's a whole bunch of like things that have to happen when when VINs are assigned, uh, like production usually has to happen. Uh, so uh, getting a VIN is a is a milestone moment, and I'm super psyched. Uh, we're trying to work with Ford. Hopefully, we can uh, do what we did with uh, the Tundra, and that is pick it up in Detroit, okay. where it's built, yep. um, and drive it back home, do a road trip with it. All right. And I don't think with the electric car, you have to worry about breaking it in. Maybe. Or a truck. May, probably not. Hopefully, we can just go out and start towing right away. That'd be pretty cool. Well, guys, let us know what you think in the comments section, All right, or if I'm, you're watching I'm, I'm this on the you podcast. One, one more sweepstakes here. All right. Okay. Just for fun. I, if you guys don't know, Tommy manages and runs our TFL Classics channel. Uh-huh. So all this stuff on Classics is, you know, from Tommy. Um, so, Tommy, I'm going to give you a very difficult one. Somebody says, you've just won the Classic Car Sweepstakes. <laughs> okay? All right. What about the only sweepstakes? And, that, that, <laughs> and the only rule is that we're going to take you to this parking lot. We're going to show you three classic cars. Uh-huh. And you can have one for free, uh-huh. but you got to drive it as your only car for the next year. Okay. All right. So they blindfold you. Yep. They walk you around the corner. There's mm-hmm. a parking lot, and there are three cars in that parking lot. <laughs> All right? Okay. One of them is a classic Mini. Uh-huh. One of them is a Duce Chevaux. Uh-huh. And one of them is a Volkswagen Beetle convertible. Oh. So which of those three cars do you choose to drive as your only car? <laughs> tick, tick. Tick for the next year. It's got to be the Beetle as an only car. Really? Yeah. Why the Beetle? It's be- because it's cheap when it breaks. Yeah. Um, parts are everywhere. Yeah. And it's, it's a convertible. It's a little bigger than the Mini. Yeah. Um, and it's a little faster than the the Citroen. The Mini and the 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 two CV are fantastic, but you can't get parts for them very easily. And the Beetle. You're so practical. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, although my Mini has been very reliable. I just drove it. I drove it over 150 miles this weekend. Wow. I added it up. That's pretty good, right? Yeah, you went on a Mini ride. How was that? It was fun. Yeah, it's good. Went um, with a bunch of people who drove way too slow, apparently. They went on a very slowly. Canyon Road doing 25 miles an hour. Very slowly in their new Minis. And that, that's saying a lot because you're doing if you're doing 15 in a classic Mini, it feels like you're doing 150. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that would be my choice. What about you? Out of those three, uh-huh. I picked a Beetle too. Yeah, it's most comfortable. It's, it's the most biggest, comfortable. It's got the, the biggest. It's yeah. a convertible, you know. Yeah. Well, my yeah, yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, it is a convertible. <laughs> I should. So, if you're wondering, on the Classics Channel, I bought a Beetle convertible very yeah. recently, which is where this is coming from. The top sort of seals. There's a good quarter inch gap along the header where wind comes <laughs> flying in, but. Oh, you drove it with the top down. <laughs> top up. Oh, top, top up. up yeah. <laughs> so, are you saying? If it rains, not only wind will come flying you'll, in. You'll, you'll get wet, it. but less wet than if the top was down. Yeah. Maybe if you drive fast enough, you might get less wet with the top down than up. <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe All so. right, guys. Well, thank you for spending this hour with us. Uh, uh, let us know in the comments below, uh, out of Tommy's conundrum, which of those three classic cards you would choose, uh, if it be the classic Mini, the Duchevo, or the Beetle Convertible. Uh, and as always, check out TFL Day Studios, where we put all of, our, all of our videos, our TikToks, our podcasts, all in one place. It's going to get better soon, hopefully. Uh, and uh, see you next time. Thanks, Tommy. Yep, see you. Bye. Bye.